Hi, what I want to do now is to move on to accounting for employee benefits and I'd like to think of you to think of this as being a very specific type of provision. The first issue which we have to consider is whether the standard is going to be an historic cost or a current value, fair value type standard. And that requires us to think about what is the liability and how does it fit into the business model. We also need to think about whether the cash flows are fixed, fixed as to amount, fixed as to timing, because if they aren't fixed and they're not certain in terms of timing, it makes an historic cost approach very difficult and you'd have to say it's going to be a fair value type standard. In relation to the provisions related to employees, they're not fixed and they're not they're uncertain as to timing. So just like with provisions, it's going to be a current value or a fair value type standard. So what does the standard apply to? Well, the standard we're talking about now is IS 19, AASB 119, and the scope of the standard is addressed in paragraph 2. It tells us that it applies to all employee benefits except for share-based payments, and these are addressed in another standard. It includes a range of employee benefits, short-term benefits, post-employment benefits, termination, long-term benefits, and termination benefits. Definitions are provided in paragraph 8, and this identifies employee benefits are all forms, forms of consideration given by an entity in exchange for services rendered or at the termination of employment. The employee benefits are subdivided into character into by characteristic. There are short-term benefits which we pay which we payable within 12 months, post-employment benefits and these are payable at the end of employment, and these are subdivided into defined contribution plans, which in Australia probably represents most of our superannuation guarantee levy contribution plans, and defined benefit plans. These are increasingly rare these days, and from an accounting perspective, they're particularly problematic. There's also termination benefits and other long-term benefits, and these are all defined in paragraph 8. I'll start off now by working through these benefits and the accounting requirements for these. When I talk about short-term benefits, the first category, what I'm really talking about here are things like annual leave and sick leave. They're the most common ones that we have to think about. And in terms of the recognition and measurement of these, it's addressed in paragraph 11. And it tells us to recognise a liability for short-term benefits which are expected to be payable with respect to past service. So obviously, if your employee's been working for you for a while and he's entitled to long service to annual leave, then you'd have to recognise a liability for that annual leave. The amount that you recognise is undiscounted, and this is probably just a practical issue because let's be honest or blunt about it, discounting a liability which is due within one year is not going to have much of an impact in material pass. So the amount that you have to recognise is the expected amount that you have to pay, and this expected idea has implications for how you recognise quite differently accumulating where you're going to have to pay and non-accumulating where you only might have to pay. So it, it has implications, that idea of expected cost. Now is the other types of benefits that are payable to employees. And I'm going to take this a little bit out of order because I think it makes life a little bit simpler, a bit easier to understand. I'm going to focus in the first instance on other long-term benefits and when I'm thinking of other long-term benefits within an Australian context I'm thinking of long service leave. This is additional leave which is payable after a period of extended service. So maybe it's after 12 weeks service you qualify for 12 weeks extra leave. In terms of how we account for these other long-term benefits it's addressed really in paragraph 155 where it says that you need to recognise a liability for the present value of the expected future cash outflows. And this is dealt with in a lot more detail in paragraphs 56 to 98. And whilst these relate to defined benefit plans, the ideas are pretty much the same. But it's easier to think about long service leave. And so what you have to do is you have to think about the expected payments that you're going to have to make in the future. And you have to discount that to today's terms. In terms of measurement, you obviously have to recognise changes in the liability in the statement of profit or loss. So if the liability goes up, you have to recognise an expense in the profit and loss. 
However, you need to distinguish between service cost and interest cost, because if you have a liability recognised on a present value basis, as time passes, the liability will increase, and that's effectively an interest cost and should be separately recognised. Please also understand that when you have long service leave or other sort of long-term benefits, it may change in value simply due to remeasurement. Maybe it's wage rates going up or something like that, a variation in the assumptions. The discount rate is specified in paragraph 83 and it's supposed to be, if it's available, the bond yield on a high quality corporate bond. If this isn't available, you can use a government bond yield. Whilst it's not common practice for long service leave entitlements to be funded, it is possible. And if this was undertaken and assets were put aside into a fund to reimburse long service leave or to cover long service leave obligations, obviously there is the possibility for those assets to be offset against the liability and reported on a net basis. That is sometimes what... Uh, unions are advocating the funding of long service leave entitlements. Termination benefits. Well, this is what happens often in the construction industry where you have, it's built into the enterprise agreement that at the conclusion of the contract, because all the workers can be paid off, there'll be a, a mandatory termination benefit. So in terms of what we'd recognize here, it's addressed in the first instance in 165, and you have to recognize it when it's no longer able to be withdrawn and also in terms of restructuring provision, if it involves a termination benefit, it has to be recognised as well. In terms of measurement, it's addressed in paragraph 169, and quite obviously if it's within, one, within 12 months, it's recognised as a short-term benefit, and it would be undiscounted. And if it's a long-term benefit, it would be uh, rec recognised on the same basis as an other long-term benefit, and discounted. So what we're seeing here across the long-term benefits fairly persistently is that we have to recognise the expected cash flow to settle on a fair value basis. What I'm to move on to now is to the last category, and that is the post-employment benefits. And some of these are easy, some of them are not so easy. In terms of defined contribution plans, these are uh, plans where the employee assumes the investment risk for the superannuation fund. And what normally happens is the employer just makes contributions on a prescribed basis as the employee provides service. So obviously we have to recognize an obligation to make payments with respect to past service, that the liability. And if it's if it's short term, which it typically is, it will be an undiscounted liability because in Australia you have to make superannuation guarantee payments within a certain period, short term, otherwise there are penalties involved. If there are long term, of course it's discounted and we've talked about that previously. Defined benefit plans are much more complex because a defined benefit plan basically takes the investment risk away from the employee and the employer bears it. So the fundamental difference of a defined benefit plan is that assets are put aside progressively and the idea is that these assets will provide a pool of assets from which a benefit can be paid at retirement. But the issue is that the benefit that's paid is predetermined by some type of formula typically. And so there's obviously going to be some risk as to whether the assets are sufficient to meet that obligation. So in terms of accounting for defined benefit plans, what it says is that you have to recognize as a defined benefit liability or an asset for the extent to which the obligations that the firm is required to meet to provide benefits is greater or less than the assets that are put aside. Now this is a very very complicated actuarial calculation so I don't want to spend too much time working through it because that's fairly specialist but if I could just outline it as this, what you have to work out is the expected benefit that you have to pay out and you have to adjust that for earnings which can be expected to be made, contributions that can be expected to be made and that will give you the present value of the obligation 
and you deduct from that the assets which are put aside to, to meet that obligation. So that gives you a net benefit or a net um, asset or liability. In terms of what impacts the cost that's recognised in a defined benefit plan, we need to recognise that some of the cost of the def defined benefit plan will be a cost for the, a service cost, which relates to the current period. This is recognised in the statement of profit or loss. There's an interest cost because, once again, we're talking about obligations which increase just by the passage of time. However, this will be offset by the extent to which the assets are also increasing over time, and so this is, means we have to recognise the net interest cost in the profit or loss. And to the extent that the defined benefit asset or liability changes through remeasurement, this is recognised not in the statement of profit or loss but in OCI, and it's not subject to recycling. In other words, it doesn't go back up into the profit loss at some later date. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about these defined benefit plans because, well, we could spend an entire week talking about these and the vagaries of how you recognise these sorts of benefits. The disclosure requirements are not very significant. Um, primarily addressed in IS1, AASB 102. However, there are supplementary disclosure requirements for the Post-employment benefits for defined contribution plans, 53, because these are relatively straightforward. For the defined benefit plans, well, these are a lot more extensive, and they are from paragraphs 135 onwards. So that's how we think about provisions for employee benefits. I'd like to think of this as just being a very specialised case of provisions generally, which we saw in AASB 137, IS 37. It's the same story, it's the same requirements, the standards say the same thing, albeit with a little bit more detail. And if you understand that, then reading these standards is pretty straightforward.